This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. First of all, let me uh, thank you all for, for coming. My name is Jamal Kokar, and as of three weeks ago, I'm the new president of the Institute of the Americas, um, having just finished five years as Canada's ambassador to Brazil. And I have to say, this is certainly not a bad trade-off, uh, Lieutenant Governor coming up from Brazil. The only thing my Brazilian colleagues would tell me is that, yeah, but do they play soccer there? So we'll have to, we'll have to work on that. Today is an important day for all of us in the sense that um, we're really using this opportunity to underscore the importance of the North American economic space and economic integration. And whether you approach it from the perspective of uh, being a Mexican, a Canadian, or an American, or a Californian, um, North American economic integration is an absolutely key issue for all of us in terms of prosperities and jobs. Um, and today we have no one better than the Lieutenant Governor Gavin um, Newsom to speak to that issue. None of this could take place um, without our sponsors, and we're delighted uh, to have um, Deborah Reed from SEMPRA here with us. Deborah, thank you very much for your, for your contributions. And um, Luis Escarreño, Duty Free Americas, and UETA, our UCTV sponsor. <laughs> and without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Chancellor Pradeep Kostel to introduce the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Jamal, and uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, UC San Diego is pleased to play a key role in this uh, 20th anniversary celebration of Sentry. And I'm told a San Diego innovation. And it was, uh, when I think about UC San Diego, when I think about San Diego, I think about UC San Diego in addition to other things. But I did not realize until I got here three, in, three and a half years ago that this was a San Diego innovation. And I must say, I think it's an extremely impactful innovation. Uh, so, it's an honor to join our colleagues and partners as we continue our collaboration to enhance, uh, as the ambassador said, border innovation. I think one cannot understate or overstate. Uh, one is good and the other uh, cannot uh, overstate the importance of cross-border co uh, cross innovation. Okay. Are you looking for votes here? Oh, <laughs> It's, it's all right. I can help. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I had, to, I had to say that. You know, typically, I'll get to that in a second. He sits uh, in the center seat of the Board of Regents, and he gets to pick on everybody. So this is my chance to... <laughs> Uh, anyway, Sentry was born out of a series of discussions in the early um, to mid-90s. Uh, this was a discussion amongst university uh, people, business and civic leaders, scholars, and people who were in general concerned about San Diego's future growth and prosperity, and quite like the roundtable discussion we have today. So before we can get to that, though, uh, we are fortunate to have my boss's boss. <laughs> no, seriously, my boss being the Office of the President, and her boss being uh, a regent, and in this case, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, he's our keynote speaker, and he is the ideal person to talk about how California's future and uh, how California's future and economy depend on partnership with Mexico, as his key priorities are economic development, job creation, improving access to higher education, and bolstering California's environmental leadership. He has an amazing background. Uh, background in both private industry, uh, having started 15 small businesses and created more than 1,000 jobs, uh, and background in local government, and we all know what he's famous for. He was one of the visionaries who saw something that many of us even today cannot see, which is 
unfortunate, but uh, thank you for your leadership in that area. Uh, and having served as supervisor and later mayor of the city and county of San Francisco. Okay, so I've had the pleasure of like, getting, getting to know him through the UC Board of Regents as he serves on the board. He is one of the most articulate, one of the most, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, the ability to put uh, simple ideas or complex ideas in very simple terms and crisply interrogate, investigate, and get to the gist of, uh, gist of the conversation and, bring, and really bring it back home to, for us, even as chancellors, to think about what is it that we are trying to get the regions to approve. So with that said, sir, this is yours. Thank you, Chancellor. Welcome. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Jamal, thank you very much for hosting us and organizing this event. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in the, in the governor's stead. Uh, it is always good to have the governor out of the state of California when you're the lieutenant governor. So uh, as your acting governor today, <laughs> let me welcome you on behalf of a grateful state. You always take advantage when the governor is out of the state, and I will do so back, not till Saturday at 3, in case you need me. Uh, you know, let me, let me uh, try to contextualize my thoughts. I won't take too much of your time. I, I, I'm here because um, we're all here uh, to celebrate leadership, to celebrate vision. Uh, but we're also here to celebrate each other and what I think makes us great. Uh, I, if you're like me, uh, it's frustrating picking up the newspaper, listening to the radio, uh, watching the news, everything that's going on around the world and Syria, uh, what's going on today, and as Putin's bringing in drones and tanks into Syria, what's happening with ISIS and what's happening in Iraq and Yemen, around the rest of the world, where nations and people literally are being torn apart because of racial, religious, ethnic controversies that have fueled fanaticism and fueled terror. But here we are in San Diego. Here we are in one of the most diverse regions, in the most diverse state, the state of California, in the world's most diverse democracy, the United States of America. And what brings us together is a fundamental principle, a value that transcends. And that is, when we are at our best, this is a state that doesn't tolerate its diversity. We truly celebrate that diversity. We celebrate, as Bill Clinton would say, all our interesting differences. But at the end of the day, we unite around our common humanity, what Dr. King talked so evocatively about. We're all bound together by a web of mutuality. We're all in this together. For me, that's an antidote to the stress, to the anxiety, to the fear that a lot of us have. Uh, and in so many ways, it's what we're celebrating today, is a recognition and an understanding of that fundamental principle, that we are at our best when we practice pluralism, when we strengthen our connections, when we celebrate all that we have to offer and unite around the things that bring us together. That's exactly what Congresswoman Lynn Shank understood in the early 1990s. And what a backdrop the early 1990s in this state. Because every single thing I just said, it wasn't self-evident in 1992, 1993. It sure as heck wasn't self-evident in 1994 in the state of California. No, xenophobia was raging wild. The nativist attitudes were raging in this state. The isolationist attitudes were alive and well. We had a governor at the time that was advancing something that three out of five Californians embraced, that proposition known as Prop 187. The embers of that, the embers of that were being lit in 1992 when Lynn became a congresswoman, 1993, and ultimately advanced in 1994. The backdrop of that time, don't forget, was not only the xenophobia, the fear of the other, but this white fear that was being advanced by politicians. That whistle we all know too much about. They changed the language, didn't they, at the time? They talked about quotas, including chancellor quotas 
that ultimately led to that same Board of Regents of which I serve on, I have 14 of its members to eliminate at this time affirmative action at the UC system, a price that is still being paid today, not just here on this campus, but all 10 campuses at the UC system. Know that fear, that white fear that promulgated in other efforts, three strikes initiative, remember at this exact same time in California. A backdrop that is dramatically different than I would argue that exists today. Well, how can that be? How could it be that a young congresswoman could understand that we could do more and do better? How could it be that she could partner with folks like Rudy Murillo, connect the dots with some of our nation's most prolific leaders at the time, Fritz Hollings, Lloyd Benson, and others, in a backdrop of a revolution that was about to come with its leader by the name of Gingrich about to ascend to that leadership position to then advance the same year, the century lane opened, a government shutdown. How familiar these words are in so many ways today. What an extraordinary backdrop. See, what I admire more than anything is leadership. We're so desperate for it in this world. And one thing I recognize, and you know, Lynn recognized this, though she had formal authority as a congresswoman at the time, but one thing I recognize is leadership can come from anywhere. When people recognize they have agency, that they can help shape the future. Even in a position of formal authority, it was very unlikely that Congresswoman Shank would be successful. Extraordinarily unlikely. So what she had to do is exercise her moral authority. And that's where true leadership resides. It's that dialectic between those in power and those outside of power, the partnerships that are formed that push us along to stand up on principle and do the right thing. At a time when everyone was focusing on what's wrong in Mexico, she changed the conversation. She changed the narrative. All of a sudden, Mexico wasn't just about drugs and violence and trafficking. All of a sudden, we started looking at 100 plus million people, at least today, very differently. Started thinking about Mexico in terms of entrepreneurs, thought in terms of cultural identity, artistic excellence, innovation. A country that today, where over half the population is under the age of 30. We recognized that true measure of power is found in forming new connections. That's real power. She practiced the art of inclusion and created an on-ramp, literally and figuratively, in a world where everyone was trying to sever those ties and create more off-ramps. It's an extraordinary story. I know I'm here, and it makes sense that I say that, but it truly is an extraordinary story. And one thing we know in life, generally, success leaves clues. And the success of this program 20 years ago has not only been replicated through other ports of entry, as you all know well, in California, but in Texas and in Arizona. It's an extraordinary example and an extraordinary story. And so, Lynn, I just want to say, long-windedly, how proud we are of you for your willingness to step up and step in, um, to recognize that um, you not only had a voice, but you had an obligation to change that narrative and to change the dialogue. And we are all better off for it. I don't want to overstate it, but I'm not going to understate it. And I just think what you did and what you accomplished is important to memorialize at a time when those nativist attitudes, those xenophobic attitudes are being revisited by folks that are running for higher office, talking about 1,900 mile walls, talking about dystopian state of police raids, talking about taking children from parents and ripping up the echo of Abe Lincoln's contribution, the 14th Amendment. We need to be reminded of 
what you all achieved 20 years ago and what we all stand for in California and here in San Diego today. So that's my message. It's one of gratitude and appreciation. And I hope that we all recognize that in this state, if we can find a way to put aside those differences, to reconcile those differences, and focusing and focus more on strengthening our connections, that there's no doubt in my mind, as the old saw and song says, the best is yet to come. Thank you all very, very much. So thank you, Mr. Acting Governor. That was, uh, that was truly an inspiring and an amazing uh, talk. That was very, thank you very much. OK, so before we begin our panel, uh, titled uh, Century Against All Odds, I'd like to give a little bit of a background on the efforts of an extraordinary group of community leaders who work with key government partners, like Congressman Lin Shank, who we heard so much about. In fact, I learned a lot in listening to Gavin this, like just now, and U.S. Attorney Alan Burson to make Century possible. So it all began in 1990, as we heard, with the idea for San Diego Dialogue, a series of discussions uh, that were happening right here uh, aimed at identifying issues and strategies that would enhance San Diego's promise. So UC San Diego was a strong partner in our community and a contributor to our region's growth back then, uh, just as we are today and just as we will be tomorrow. Uh, innovation is in our DNA, and we've always had a mission of finding solutions to societal cha challenges. So UC San Diego played a leading role in the dialogue with our community partners, which led to the consensus that San Diego's greatest potential for growth lay in its proximity to Tijuana. But the congestion and wait times at the border proved a barrier to bar border commerce and innovation. So of course, the story doesn't end there. And as anthropologist Margaret Mead was spot on when she said, never doubt a small group of thought thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So our panelists right now will share with you what was done to overcome those challenges and hurdles to create Sentry, including Congresswoman Lynn Schenck's role at the federal level to secure approval. And I think uh, nobody could have said this better than our Lieutenant Governor himself. Uh, so with that said, I want to turn this over to my dear friend, my dear colleague, our well-known leader in the community, somebody who knows everybody and everybody knows her. Need I say her name? Mary Walshaw. Well, everybody's getting on the uh, stage, our panelists. Lynn, I want you to know that Kevin Faulkner declared today Century Day in San Diego. I know Lynn's house, I know her office. I hope you can find room for this declaration from the mayor acknowledging the 20th anniversary of Century. And I'm not gonna read all the whereases, but I think <laughs> echoing uh, 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 Gavin's comments, uh, this was a pivotal moment in this region's history, and I think in California. And it's recognized across the political spectrum. And so congratulations, Lynn. I'll help you carry it home tonight. Oh, no, it's going to hang in Pradeep's office. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and while Mary's coming up here, I just want to re-echo the invitation I gave to our lieutenant governor. I hope that you'll speak at my funeral. <laughs> 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 oh, you're, you're the MC. <laughs> so what I would like to do sort of as a beginning because of who's here in the room, Lynn, is thank and acknowledge uh, a group of uh, San Diego and Tijuana leaders who 20 years ago began working together to uh, define where they thought the region could go in terms of building uh, an economy uh, that would be prosperous and equitable and uh, leverage the assets of both the United States and Mexico. I'm only going to take a moment because I really want the light to shine on Lynn's work today because 
if we hadn't gotten this legislation, nothing else would have happened. But as of 1990, people like Bill Rick, Bill Nelson, Mickey Fredman, Brut Krulak, some of you remember him, the editor of the Union Tribune. Debbie and I were talking about Tom Page, then the CEO of San Diego Gas and Electric, the Chancellor Pradeep of UCSD, Dick Atkinson, came together to talk about the leadership void in San Diego. Thank you for mentioning leadership, because there was a leader waiting to uh, make things happen. And very quickly, those roundtable discussions led to the importance of our connection to Mexico. And I remember Malin Burnham saying to me, if when I had joined this group, I had thought I would be looking south rather than north for our future, I'm not sure I would have joined the group. <laughs> and he has become one of the most uh, outspoken champions of the integration of our cross-border region, both socially and economically. Uh, mention was made of Dick Atkinson, but also Bill McGill, who many of you will remember, who was the retired president of Columbia University, chaired this group. And he coached Chuck Nathanson, the director of the San Diego Dialogue, and me on how to move an agenda forward. So this organization was building a kind of readiness in San Diego, and Lynn and I have had animated conversations, uh, a readiness to make the border work if someone could champion, as you described, legislation that would turn the tide. And that person was Lynn. So what we'd like to do in this session is start with Lynn. Now, he stole some of your thunder. But I have heard these wonderful stories over the years from Lynn about how she, with the help of Rudy Murillo, but also thanks to Mel Katz and Chuck Nathanson coming and talking to her early in the process, picked up this mantle and ran with it. Lori and I are here to be the local yokel lore that is the context, what was going on here while she was working in Washington. And Sally is very important because the legislation was signed, I think it was January, August, 94, but the lane didn't open until November 95. And that's where Sally's history and the work of many of the people in this room kicked in in a very important way in terms of coming up with an approach to implementing a trusted, what we, we will then we called the, uh, commuter, hi, the commuter lane, trusted commuter lane. I can't remember what we called it. Initially, Dedicated. In, initially had a lot of names. Yeah, initially had a lot of names. Uh, Sally's right. It was a DCL, dedicated commuter lane. Yeah. So with that, Lynn, you get to start. Well, uh, one. one thing. Uh, Lori was my chief of staff. This isn't why, Lori. And yes. as every person who has a chief of staff knows, including Gavin, they go first. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't want to go first. The only thing I want to say is, Lieutenant Governor, and you'll appreciate it, Lynn was a freshman member of Congress, okay? Lynn was a freshman member of Congress. It usually takes at least two or three terms just to find the restroom. So, with I that being never said. Found, I never found it, all right, well. <laughs> I, uh, I, really, I, I feel like I'm at my own eulogy or something <laughs> this is. But uh, first of all, to uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, uh, your able aide here, Tracy, who got her start with me. I, I saw her fine fingerprints there, and certainly Rudy. So that, but, but thank you. Chancellor, thank you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for hosting this. Uh, I, and for all of the men in the audience, thank you for wearing a coat and tie on a day like this. <laughs> so you, you've gotten a lot of the, the backdrop. Here, uh, pre-1993, San Diego, uh, lots of things going on, the business community, certainly uh, the uh, role of the university and especially the San Diego Dialogue, looking south, looking to what is going on. Lots of things anecdotally that we knew, lots of things intuitively that we knew. 
But the dialogue, uh, being an academic institution under Mary's leadership and Chuck Nathanson, the, the late, great Chuck Nathanson, decided to get facts and figures. And they came out with a report, Who Crosses the Border? Well, again, for San Diegans, it wasn't shocking, but for others, it was. 97% of those who cross the border both ways do so for work, for education purposes, for visits, family visits, for tourism. In other words, for the everyday of life. And what was the big blockage, blockage like a blockage in an artery? And that was the border. Uh, so we had Chuck and, and his group uh, and, and Mary's group coming up with all of the, these wonderful uh, public policy uh, background papers that are so necessary, as the Lieutenant Governor knows, to implement, uh, to get the start in, in legislation. But there were other things going on pre-1993. Uh, we here in San Diego were represented by simply one of the most extraordinary members of Congress ever to have served, Lionel Van Dierlen. And he represented the, the South Bay area. His chief of staff was Rudy Murillo. Rudy was uh, very nuanced and knowledgeable in what was going on in this area. And uh, by the time I got to Congress, uh, Lionel Van Dierlen Van had retired, and Rudy was at what was then called INS, one of the precursors to uh, uh, the Border and Customs uh, Department agency now. Uh, Rudy was in that agency at a time when coming from San Diego, when he knew what needed to be done as well. And he was looking for initiatives to increase the number of inspectors, not for power purposes, but to open more lanes. In fact, one day there was an experiment and all 22 lanes were open and lo and behold, cars went through in two, three, four minutes. Right. So he was trying to do that. There was at INS uh, a, a uh, and, and I don't know if they were working with the university, but, but maybe also sort of a nascent uh, approach to having a, a dedicated commuter lane. So, so that was all there uh, when I took office in, in 1993. There were a number of sort of key turning points. And uh, Lori, as I said, was my chief of staff, and unlike most members of Congress, I had my chief of staff in the community, in the district, so that she was in charge here and, and going back and forth. Uh, so she really had her ear to what was, was going on and had uh, under her uh, some staff uh, who she directed, and she will tell you, jump in any time you want about this one. There was a, a young woman by the name of Rochelle Roseman, Rochelle Bold now, who would, uh, on a daily basis, sort of look for initiatives. Cause we weren't going to just be reactive, we were going to be proactive. After 2 o'clock. After 2 o'clock, yes. <laughs> After 2 o'clock, we learned from the Congresswoman, you put down the REACT file and you go to the PROACT file. <laughs> well, Rochelle came across uh, this interesting tidbit that in uh, Blaine, Washington, there was a commuter lane to Canada. And she brought that to Lori, and uh, Lori got in touch with Rudy, and because all friends, uh, if you take away anything from this, and I'm just going to interrupt myself, and those of you in government and politics will know this to be true, and maybe even in academia, it's luck and it's who you know, and it's the relationships that you develop. It's something that, at least today, robots and machines can't do yet. You know? <laughs> it's coming, but, but not yet. So uh, my staff and Rudy, lots of back and forth, and uh, lo and behold, uh, one day I, I get a call that um, Chuck Nathanson of The Dialogue wants to come and see me, and Mel Katz, who was then uh, just, I think, cycled off as president of the local Chamber of Commerce, but was on the dialogue board, right, uh, that they wanted to come and see me. And they came in with this proposal for a dedicated commuter lane as one, one tool to ease the congestion at the border. Right? Well, 
Sounded great to me, sounded great to Lori. See, we were so naive in the ways of Washington, we had no idea that there was <laughs> this huge artery blocking uh, uh, roadblock by the name of Congressman Jack Brooks. Jack Brooks, may he rest in peace. I love the guy, you know, he's just like, he could have played himself on television. Uh, <laughs> Congressman from Texas, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Very powerful, very powerful committee. Right? Uh, Jack had a, a, a personal bias, shall we say, am I saying that diplomatically, uh, Ambassador? A personal bias against a commuter lane at the southern border. So much so that the pilot project, and if I'm gonna get too deep in the weeds, just, you know, well, yawn or something and I'll get the message. <laughs> Uh, the, the pilot project at the northern border was expiring and it, he had to, uh, there, there had to be an appropriation to continue it. So the 94 appropriations bill, which was written in 93, extended the pilot project in Blaine, Washington and specifically in language in the bill prohibited one at the southern border. So not only do we have a congressman who is opposed to this, he, we got a law against it, right? So uh, we, we um, proceeded to write the legislation, the staff and myself, we write the legislation. And uh, I, meanwhile, locally, Lori is gathering up the support, the business community, the dialogue, and another very key player. And you're gonna hear names, and I'm not name dropping, I'm giving due to the people who made this happen. Right? Because uh, when something is successful, there are a lot of parents. It's only failure that's an orphan, right? So there were a lot of parents to this. And a key person was then the US Attorney, Alan Burson. With a less visionary uh, U.S. attorney, it could have been dead on arrival, right? But Allen embraced this, he endorsed it, he became really um, uh, like a cheerleader. He and Lori locally talked to everybody that needed to be talked to and then some, and especially with local INS and, and customs, and uh, uh, Sally was there, you'll remember, of course, that uh, more so at the federal level than the local level, there was pretty strong opposition from INS and customs uh, to have a, a commuter lane. So anyway, Alan uh, agreed to, to get on board and Lori uh, at, at, uh, if, if created a local task force, a com commuter, but what did you call it, a fast commuter? It was, it was kind of, yeah, it was under the auspices of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Congressman's Office, it was we, both. Yeah, so uh, I chaired it, Alan co-chaired it, and there were regular meetings, and so what came out of this was that we would um, bring it, that what? Jan, well, go ahead. No, Jan, well, that was later. Yeah. Yeah. She's still telling me what to do, you know? <laughs> and I still have to listen. But we, uh, we, we wrote the legislation and introduced it. Uh, so the uh, task force was created like January, February of 94. And by that spring, we had some legislation that would overturn the prohibitive language in the prior year's appropriations bill. Can't believe I still remember this. All right, so Jack Brooks was not amused. Right? And as Lori pointed out, I'm a freshman. Uh, freshmen get maybe one priority uh, in a cycle, ma mainly none, uh, but I wanted, this was one of my priorities and I wanted to get this done. And so uh, on the floor of the House, uh, Congressman Brooks very sweetly and in a charming way told me that he is going to assign, that it was going to his committee and it was going to be assigned to a subcommittee that will kill it. So. I have a little hearing impairment, and sometimes when I hear no, it sounds like yes. And, and, and I know Lori has the same kind of in, impairment. So we said, oh, okay, they're gonna figure this out, but we didn't know what to do. So I pick up the phone and I call Rudy Murillo. And Rudy just hates this. He loves to be behind the scenes. We tried to get him on the panel, he, he declined. Just hates this. So go, go, <laughs> go step out or something. Anyway. Rudy became my it absolutely uh, the, the, the genius that I let out of the bottle there. 
the advisor that I needed on the strategy, what to do, how to do it. Now, there is an old saying that if you have a weak stomach, you do not want to watch how they make sausage or laws. So now you're eating lunch. I'm not going to get too deep into my recipe for the sausage. But suffice it to say that Rudy had two very important pieces of advice. One was that INS and Customs had to get something big out of it. That meant money, that meant more people, that meant facilities, right? And the, the key was introducing another person into the equation, and that is a senator from South Carolina by the name of Fritz Hollings. Now in the 80s, I was very involved, uh, and Republicans, you can plug your ears, I could, but you have one of these committees too. I was very involved in the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee to elect United States senators, and so a number of them, and uh, my friend Bill Lurack here was very involved with me in, in that, and Saul Lizabram, and we uh, elected a lot of U.S. senators. In fact, I knew more senators than I knew members of the House at one point. Fritz Hollings was one of them, but more important, he was a friend of Lionel Van Derlin and Rudy Murillo. Now, why is he important? Well, Senator Hollings was chair of the authorization committee, the Senate Commerce Committee, but even more important than that, he chaired the subcommittee on appropriations on commerce and the judiciary through which the, these monies go. So basically, Rudy was, and I'm going to be very blunt here, was counseling an end run against around Jack Brooks and the House Judiciary Committee, a very risky move. But as I say, we were naive, and we said, oh, that sounds like a good move. So we, we met with Senator Hollings. Uh, he, because of Van and Rudy, uh, agreed that he would, if we could get it in the House appropriations, that he would be inclined to support this in the Senate. Lots of back and forths, staff talking to staff, sort of behind the scenes, a, a lot of, and, and Lori knew more about this than, than I because she was part of it, talking to the House Appropriations uh, Committee. Meanwhile, we got other people involved. Uh, uh, I think the chancellor, or, or maybe you, Gavin, mentioned uh, Lloyd Benson. Lloyd Benson was uh, a former uh, United States senator from Texas and was at this time the Secretary of the Treasury under which Customs uh, resided. And now Lloyd Benson loved San Diego. He spent a lot of time here. He had a home in Rancho uh, Valencia. And he and his wife, B.A., and my husband and I would socialize. And uh, so when he was here one time, and Bill, I think it was at your house, that you know, I hit him up uh, for the dedicated commuter lane, and he said he would see what he could do with one of his departments, that is uh, customs. Uh, meanwhile, also, we had a friend in the White House, and it wasn't the president, John Emerson, who is now our ambassador to Germany. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so John, a Californian, a, again, a friend that we could call on, uh, we wanted to make sure that he uh, got the message to Customs and INS and others and to Congressman Brooks that the White House was supportive of a commuter lane at the southern border. So all of this is, is going on. And meanwhile, Alan Burson uh, in invited Janet Reno, his boss, the U.S. Attorney, to come to San Diego. You want to comment on that visit? Because you were very involved in that. Let well, I, I will when we talk about collaboration, but everybody who was anybody that needed to be at that meeting at the border was there. Yeah, from the business community, from the dialogue, yeah. right. from and the we, university. And we did a very large forum fronteriza with her, which many of you may remember, yeah. coincidental with that visit. Yeah. Yeah. It was very powerful. But here's just a little tidbit. So in Washington, Janet and I lived in the same apartment building right off Pennsylvania Avenue. She liked to walk to the Justice Department. I would take a bus up to the hill, but I would walk with her to the bus stop. I did this because she had like this phalanx of security guys <laughs> in, in cars behind her. And so I ran into her in the hall one day and said, you know, you're getting this invitation from the U.S. Attorney in San Diego. Here's what it's about. And, and it was wonderful because to have the Department of Justice 
who, under which INS resided at the time, be supportive was very, very important. So uh, meanwhile, we're, we're pushing this and uh, the, the outcome of it, and I'll get the, the, to the point here of the outcome, which was very important. The House Appropriations Subcommittee Chair agreed to put in what I called wishy-washy language, but it was enough. It wasn't gonna overturn the prior year's appropriation, but it was enough to get it over to the Senate, where it landed in the office of none other than Senator Hollings, who immediately amended the appropriations bill to uh, overturn the restriction on a southern dedicated commuter lane and to appropriate funding for one here in San Diego specifically. What this meant was now it could go to a conference committee between the House and the Senate conferees. And uh, meanwhile, Jack Brooks is getting calls from the White House, from Diane Feinstein, who we in engaged, uh, getting calls from uh, Lloyd Benson, from a, a whole variety of, of people, uh, that he rethought it. And uh, one day I got the word that he would not oppose the conference language being changed to the Senate language. And that's how we got that. And, uh, uh, he wanted to deliver this message to me personally in his office. I was not asked to sit down. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of things on his agenda, shall we just say, that uh, he needed some votes on in the future. So, you know, I, the, the local paper said that I outmaneuvered one of the most powerful people in the House. It wasn't outmaneuvering. It was collaboration. It was negotiation, it was cajoling, it was not giving up, and it was just plain old-fashioned horse trading and being very lucky. I often say I'd rather be lucky than smart. I'm not very smart, so I have to be lucky. And it was uh, just a lot of luck of the right people here in San Diego, in Washington, uh, the, the, the people who knew one another being knitted together. And in August of 1994, President Clinton signed the bill. So it's a long-winded way of saying what happened over a two-year period. Fantastic <laughs> story. And <laughs> 20 years ago, 1995, correct? That's when we opened the door. But prior to that, I would say about maybe eight months prior to that, they started to assemble a team of officers who were going to work and design the enrollment center for um, a dedicated commuter lane on the southwest border. So uh, we just had to basically put our skills that we used every single day on the border as officers, um, our interviewing, what we required of people when they, when they came across the border. And we didn't change that. We just stuck to those basic functions that we perform every day. We did not want to make it the impossible. But because we were initially in a test phase, we did have to be very cautious on how we rolled out the program. We did not want the program to fail. We received our marching orders um, from our district director at the time, who was Mr. Mark Reed. I think Mr. Mark Reed should get some credit also. Yeah. <laughs> and Rudy Morello was his chief of staff. <laughs> right, Rudy? You were Mr. Mark Reed's chief of staff or special assistant to the district director in the INS days. And so I was a, an INS uh, inspector who was assigned to the initial team. I think we were four. There were um, three male officers and one female. I'm going to have to say that, and I was the lead. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I just have a question. Um, if. What kind of communication devices were we using 20 years ago? You took my line, no cell phones. No cell phones, right? No cell phones, right? So you can only imagine what type of technology was rolled out 20 years ago for us um, to deploy or put together a dedicated commuter lane. So on the way here, I was telling our DFO, Mr. Flores, and our port director at San Ysidro, Mr. Aki, I had totally forgotten about the first fingerprint uh, system that we received at Otay Mesa. It was the state of the art. It was probably the size of three yeah. huge commercial refrigerator freezers. <laughs> 
but we were so excited because we'd never had this type of technology before. And so we were getting all of this, what we thought was, you know, it was brand new technology. <clears throat> For 20 years ago, it was the best technology that was out there. And so using the technology 20 years ago, um, working with the two contractors, there was EDS and SAIC, one for hardware and one for software, and working with uh, the community. Um, we couldn't have done it without the Otay Mesa Chamber, the San Isidro Chamber, um, our Mexican partners. Um, I recall myself going over to Tijuana weekly, monthly, to give presentations about Sentry or the dedicated commuter lane, uh, giving presentations to the maquiladoras. And so with all of that, putting all that together and then coming up with those first 500 uh, business people that were going to test, assist with the test of the concept on the, on the southern border. And then Otay Mesa, of course, being selected was huge for us. Uh, you mentioned against all odds. We, we had some of that internally also, right? Um, we had to change the mindset of our officers, of our, our partners um, there on the border. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for us was that we were gonna have this lane and the people that were gonna be using the lane were trusted travelers. Uh, we had set the parameters. We had set, you know, you couldn't have a felony. Uh, misdemeanors, it was going to be two. Uh, you had to have employment. You had to cross the border frequently initially. And so with all of these things set into place, and discussing them with the officers, because the officers had to feel comfortable. That was a huge challenge, is that those officers that were going to be manning the lane had to feel security, that it was a secure lane in order to have an expedited crossing. And so lots of discussion with the officers. And so initially um, built into the program were what we call random compliance. Um, how many of you were here, were one of the first 500? Anybody? Wow, great, okay, so you remember that initial compliance, okay? So with 500 people, you had people going into secondary. Well, the officers said, no, we wanna see them more. So we changed the compliance rate. Okay, we'll make it higher. So we made it higher, requiring the users to go into secondary more. A couple weeks later, they said, we're not catching anything. Lower that rate. You're just creating a lot of work for us. So we went back and forth with a lot of that dialogue internally with the officers. And so me being one of those officers, <clears throat> excuse me. And so it had a negative you know, tone to it if you belong to the dedicated commuter lane staff. And so you were kind of like the enemy because you were going against what was traditionally the standard for working at a port of entry. And so we proved them wrong, you know, real soon because there were no apprehensions. And so as people continued to go into secondary, um, everyone was compliant. And um, shortly after that, we went from 500 to 2,000 to 5,000, expansion to San Isidro, expansion to Texas, expansion to Calexico. And so it didn't, the concept did not take long for us to demonstrate that uh, San Diego was definitely the right location to test the concept and then expand further. And so very happy that I was part of that and to see it 20 years later. As my, as my good friend Lori Black says, it takes all kinds of leadership. It takes leadership at the national level, but I think we just heard an example of leadership here at the local level. Thank you for that. So Lori, you get to editorialize now. Oh <laughs> I love editorializing. Um, Jack Valente, the late Jack Valente, if you remember, he used to represent the motion picture industry. Um, about 24 years ago, introduced Lynn Shank, and he said, in politics, there are two kinds of people, two kinds of horses. There's work horses and there's show horses. And boy, don't we know those show horses who watch the Republican debate. Um, <laughs> I don't care. I, my Republican friends were mortified. <laughs> Lynn Shank is a workhorse. She's a workhorse. It's one of the reasons I wrote to her back in 1979 when I was in college and said, whatever you do in life, I want to be a part of it. 
And when she decided to run for Congress, I had a 10-week-old, a 2-year-old, and a 4-year-old. And I said, don't do it. She <laughs> said, I'm doing it. And so we did it. And um, it was quite the ride. But the best part of working with Lynn is that we worked with the community. And as her chief of staff, so you keep in mind the politics, this was not a safe seat. This was an even Stephen Republican Democrat seat, the new 49th. It's very important you know that. Because in 92, the reason what was very helpful was that Ross Perot ran and took 29% of the vote, so it allowed our Democratic friends to win. And Bob Filner and Lynn Shank, two Democrats, won. Don't say that name in the I'm same gonna say with something. Me. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> Let me just go back to workhorses and show horses. <laughs> I think it's a part of the story. Bob is nowhere on this thing, and his district represented it, for God's sake. So excuse me. It is for the record, right? Um the other thing I wanted to make the point of, we did do this, and this is really important. We did this without cell phones, smartphones. We were just getting computers in. This was about relationships, and it hasn't changed in our community. When we get things done, like the library, and like Petco, and North Embarcadero Visionary Plan, and I could keep going through, those are all collaborative efforts with elected officials, and with community, with business groups, and, and, the, and the very level, I mean, community groups want to be here, but the community groups who really know what they want their neighborhoods, their villages, their cities, and their counties to look like. And that's really what this was about. But somebody has to be the leader, the leader that we can depend upon, because we can't always depend on the leadership. So we had two things we used to say in the office. Like, milk does a body good. I came up with this right after Lynn won, and I said, Lynn Shank takes care of business. You know, I'm sure I got some look from her. Yeah, right. I said, that's what we're going to be. And we went to the Chamber of Commerce. I had never been to the Chamber of Commerce <laughs> building. Now, I was a little longer than, younger than Lynn, but I was still over 30. And we walked in, and Gil Partida was the new president. Remember that name? We had a Hispanic president of the Chamber of Commerce, and Mel Katz, a Jew, was the head of the board. I mean, oh my god. And we, but you had to realize, you, we got things done. These weren't people who were show horses. These are people who wanted to do something. And then you take a visionary like Chuck Nathanson, and you add that vision into it, and you take somebody like an Alan Burson, who along with Lynn, two of the smartest people I know on the planet Earth. I mean, Alan is working in Interpol today, representing our country around the world for this president. And so you have all these sort of legal minds. You have lots of color in the room. That's not the kind of thing we were seeing because of the xenophobia of Proposition 187, which passed in 1994. So all I can say is, for my two years, there were a lot of things that got accomplished during the two years of a freshman woman member of Congress. She was the first woman south of LA. You know, some people will look at me and say, I'm sure you get this, she does too. She says, once you're a chief of staff, you're always a chief of staff. So, you know, between Governor Brown and G Governor Davis, sh she nails me because I'm still the chief of staff after all these years. But it was such a pleasure and an honor to be a part of it. Um, I think what's also very important in contemporary world, I had a baby, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old when we were doing this. We were changing diapers on Lynn's desk when she was in Washington. <laughs> and you know what? That was okay because she wanted me there. We had a serendipitous relationship. And between myself, Rochelle, Bill Bold, and others who are still some of the smartest in our community, with Lynn's leadership, we could really depend and do some great things. And whenever I go through there, I think of you and Jack Brooks. He was tough. <laughs> so thank you very much for the honor of being here today, Chancellor. Thank you for watching my daughter. And Lynn, thank you for being my sister and Mary in life. I am grateful. Thank you. Uh,
Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here on the 20th anniversary of Century. Um, I think the mayor misnamed the day because I think it should have been named Lynn Shank Day. How many of you agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> When, um, when you hear the story of what was done to accomplish getting the Century Lane in place, it, it tells a lot about the people. But I know Lynn because she's on our board of directors. And so what, what we just heard about the relentlessness and the uh, continued effort to get something that was unachievable or seemed unachievable done is so much about this person. And uh, it, it was just did so much for our region to be able to be to have a flow of traffic across the border. And here we are now, 20 years later, looking at how we improve the flow of traffic across the border so that uh, people and cars can flow as easily as energy does across the border as our company works with many of the Mexican utility companies. So it is my great pleasure to uh, have Lynn come up and join me. Yep. No. <laughs> I'm not acting as chair of the board today, Lynn. Um, but it is my great pleasure to honor Lynn uh, in the 20th anniversary of Century and all of the work that she did to make this happen for our region. So please join me in a round of applause for this wonderful lady. Thank you. <laughs>